You specialize in a lot of spirits, not just gin. Uh, you specialize in trapa, raki, and then rum, and of course absinthe. And uh, thank you so much for agreeing to be with Drinks and Destinations uh, Insta Live today. This is your second time with the Drinks and Destinations show. First one was with the uh, Drinks and Destinations podcast, which was really good. I remember that was a very nice episode. Uh, it was so thank great you for being here. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite nice. Uh, yes, so we are going to talk about gin. And uh, you know that gin has been around for centuries. It also made a com- comeback recently. So uh, let's start with the origin of gin. Where exactly did it start? And you know how uh, how is the evolution of gin uh, trend that happened all over the world? Well, I think uh, if we talk about evolution of gin, we are not getting around uh, the Dutch because uh, actually it all started um, um, in, 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 with, the, with the Dutch people. So um, they used to do something just with juniper and a little bit of coriander. And uh, I think it's, well, there are lots of stories around that, but um, it's been mainly the Brits that went into the, uh, it's been one of those uh, Spanish Dutch successor wars when some Brits joined in as, uh, as soldiers. and. That's where they get in touch with uh, with the juniper spirit, and uh, they took it home. So that's that's the origins of now. But in former okay. times, when we talk about that old that old spirit, um, it used to be a double distilled grain, like the basis uh-huh. for a single malt whiskey, and uh-huh. uh, then they simply distilled the third time with uh, with juniper and with coriander and a little bit of citrus peels. Okay. So when it comes to the types and styles of gins, what are the basic rules that has to be followed when you're making a gin? Well, nowadays it's quite clear. In Europe, it's quite clear. Each country or each uh, each big country has its own uh, legislation, like Europe and the US. I'm pretty sure India has its own legislation too. But in Europe, you need to have uh, really pure ethanol. So you start on a base like with vodka and um, then you add your ingredients and the law is quite clear. It says uh, juniper is the predominant aroma in gin. So that's also something uh, within the last years we are seeing more and more vanishing but junipers should be quite strong and intense. Uh, So in the 18th century uh, was gin made in the same exact way, the way it's being made now? Or uh, has there been any uh, major changes in terms of uh, the gin production styles and type? That's a good question. Well, what we know from from ancient books is uh, that the origins of gin in and around London was quite cumbersome. And it all came from uh, Willem III of Orange that became a Belgian guy, that became king uh, of, of the Brits. And um, he forbid cognac. So people asked him, so what shall we drink? Because cognac was the preferred drink those days. And they said, well, if you can't afford to drink cognac, then drink gin. Yes. So, um, okay. well, the original product was called Geneva. And uh, uh, it's, it's believed that they shortened it because a Brit can't really spell Geneva right. So. Uh, it's a shortening so they they shortened it to gin over over the years and they didn't know what's inside they just knew it's uh it's greenish and uh old recipes show they had awful stuff in they they even had it in pee instead of water so the the beginnings weren't that easy and they had about 200 years uh, which uh, went into history that was that was a dark time for for britain especially for, for London, you have to imagine there were about 7,500 gin shops uh, pouring gin uh, with literally wow. no VAT or tax on it. So uh, they started they started putting on taxes to, to keep people away from gin. Uh, even in those times, uh, terpene was part of the recipe to bring that, uh, that greenish notes in. So. There is one, one famous painting, and I, you, you should refer to that and, and, and Google it. William Hogarth uh, 
painted something called Jin Lane, and it shows pictures quite perfectly a street scene from that time. Actually, he painted two paintings. One is called Jin Lane, uh, which okay. should shock people away from Jin, and the other one is called uh -huh. Beer Lane, which shows um, proper and uh, drink beer drinking people. And uh, yeah. in Jin Lane, you see the church breaking down. Death uh, stands in, in, in the back of the picture with the sense. Um, pe people were drunk and that was horrible times. And, it, it and the distilleries used to be located inside the city, right? At that point of time in London, everywhere the distilleries were, uh, I mean, basically all over the place. Absolutely. There was yeah. no restriction as such. Yeah. In the beginning, no. When was the clear definition of gin styles that you can find in record? Well, I mean, the first uh, the first sign of a second type of gin goes into the 1700s when uh, you find first records of something called Old Tom Gin. And those Old yes. Tom Gin was obviously um, sweetened with uh, liquor rice because they didn't have sugar at that time. So it was heavenly sweetened with licorice and uh, mm -hmm. that was a separate style besides the very dry and possibly terpene containing gin at that time. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, um, well, but by law, there are certain styles. In Europe, you can produce gin, distilled gin and dry gin. And the idea behind is simply by differentiating if you add anything after distillation, if you're not adding on anything um, it's, it's a dry gin. If you add on something after distillation, like uh, you add some flower pots um, after distillation, then we may call it distilled gin. And if it's just... Right now, craft gins are a huge thing. Organic gins are a huge thing. So all this started in what? In last one decade or so? Absolutely. I mean, if we look um, at gin at the moment, here in German language areas in, in Europe or even in main, main Europe, mainland Europe, people, like you asked in, in the beginning, um, believe that gin, gin, the gin hype is already going down. If you look at the numbers, it's not. But uh, we, we see that gin hype for almost 15 years now here in Europe, and it's not everywhere the same. So it seems it all started at for this last hype in, in Spain and uh, then went through the German language areas and now returning back to Britain because uh, if you look at the numbers in Britain it's only for the last three four years that they really go up and up so our gin hype might be in the end possibly in Britain it's it is in it's, India it's, it's a huge it's, thing it's in now the top in, in India it's a big thing like I discovered last time Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, actually, slow gin is something that comes uh, out of history. If you look, uh, I know you've been to Britain before. Um, if yes. you wander around the countryside in uh, in, in autumn, uh, you find sloes. Sloe is a, is a very old, actually, it's one of the oldest kind of prunes. It's the, the first prune thing. It's very small. And um, people harvest it, they picked it. Um, and they have a quite uh, thick skin, so um, they took needles or something like that and uh, pushed into the skin and then they simply put it into a big jar with gin and let it rest mm -hmm. for five, six, seven months before they uh, took out the snows again and had a proper drink and actually they obviously added in some sugar. So that's mm -hmm. the, the idea behind snow. Must add in that the, the German language distillers have a certain different idea of a slow gin than the original British ones. Um, as mostly people did it at home and it rested in jars for a month. In Britain, if you focus on slow gin, it's more on the uh, oxidized side, like if you look at port or, oh. or sherry. Okay. Here, where we have fruit distillers in the German language areas, they really want spot on a fresh prune fruit and some acidity. Yeah. So that's, that's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. So now that we are talking about gin and styles, let's have our 
tasting, which we decided that we will do today online. That's yeah, yeah. my bottle of Hendrix gin. It's one of my favorites, actually. Yeah. Great. It's a very awesome. nice gin. It's a very nice gin, it's, and I think yeah. it was one of here in Europe. It was one of those gins that came along with that first hype. So ten, mm-hmm. twelve years ago, Hendrix is about twelve years old now. As a brand yes. here in Europe. So, so yeah. What, what what do you like? What do you like on on the, on that product? You said it's one of your favorites. I think it's the. Uh, I think that obviously besides the juniper, it's the citrus notes which are prominent. But I also like the uh, finish of cucumber, which is the signature of Hendrix actually, and. And the hint of rose petals, as they say, which is actually there in the bottle, you can feel that. I mean, to, to be it. fair, to be honest, this is, it's a very complex gin. Um, it is. Yeah. You already mentioned, yeah, the the, 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 the Bulgarian rose flowers and, uh, and the cucumber. And people always think it must be very pungent and intense, but uh, oh. it, it's not, it's not, it's very discreet but it's it's there you find the cucumber combined with the rose petals and there's a lot more in i mean you have lemon peels and orange peels yes that citrus note is quite and it's not so when only you're tasting rose. It, sorry when you're tasting good gin uh what is the signs that you are looking at because you should be looking at when you're picking up a bottle of gin or tasting gin how do you know it's great well i think that's one of the uh, the most common asked questions to me and possibly to you as well as we both yeah, judge competitions yeah. um and people constantly ask why is it good or bad but i think it's not only that line between good and bad but it's also a second line from is it classic or modern i mean okay. you, you just can say is it good or bad i mean if we focus on is it good obviously it must be balanced nothing should stand uh, stand out and um, the alcohol must be co- quite clean i mean we, we both had products before when you had a bad taste of the raw alcohol or um, okay. When you have coriander sticking out, getting that soapiness, almost cheesiness, when you have too much of coriander. So it must be balanced, it must be clean, and it must be expressive. I think that that's something that decides between is it good or bad. And then to go further, you need some information about the gin itself. Is it a classic dry gin, or is it like we in Europe call it... Um, um, new Western style gin. That's something uh, which is absolutely opposite of what gin shall be. The less what juniper, the, well, uh, new Western style is something almost lacking juniper, but having lots of fruit, citrus, flowers, and that's very, very, very. Um, people like it. It it goes through mm-hmm. the roof. So I mean, um, for me, this is not proper gin. There is no juniper in. I said, well, mm-hmm. at least half of them you you tell us it's not proper gin are selling best, and that mm-hmm. that's something that gives me headaches. <laughs> because I mean, if maybe people because tell, people don't know what is a good gin. I mean, they have never tasted it. They don't know exactly how gin should be. Probably, I think they are already a step ahead. I got really answers like, you know. I like this gin because I don't like juniper. And if you get such an answer, there is there's something wrong, Obviously. you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, That's funny. We divide it. I mean, you know, competitions, we divide it into modern and dry because London dry or dry commonly is a very juniper forward thing. There is no way around that you source the fresh and well, fresh we mostly talk about dried uh, botanicals, but they need to be spot on quality and fresh. Uh, I mean, you can buy a certain uh, a juniper in, in cooking shops, uh, buy it a lot, and then uh, you open the bag and you smell in, and you got a, a very oily and almost rancid aroma. 
because it's old. So that's yeah. not something you can use for a for a proper gin because that will carry over into the gin and they have a rancid gin. So uh, it it need to be high quality base materials. A little bit peppery. I mean, you you get that peppery note from from the juniper. There is the freshness of the citrus. Yeah. There's some soft coriander in the back even that gives it yeah. a lingering smell. So if you say I this is your, your favorite... I think strong coriander notes. You think you wow. get strong coriander notes? Yeah, and when you add a little bit of water, you yeah. get uh, the pepperiness just jumps out of the glass. Absolutely, absolutely. It's too strong. I, I never uh, actually experienced so much of pepper on the Hendrix, uh, you know, bottle ever. I mean, this is the first time I'm actually getting that on the, maybe it's a glass, uh, it's, a, it's a standard no, 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 tasting no. glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have a one without stem, okay. sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a two-folded thing. The pepperiness can come from the juniper, but also uh, if you go a bit deeper in, into the recipe of, um, of Hendrix, there is cuvette pepper in, so uh, there actually is okay. pepper in. Yeah. Gin in Scotland comes from the history, but it also is a, a big part of, uh, of the future. I'm pretty sure you know about the lots of small scale and craft whiskey distilleries uh, opening within the last years. And not only yes. in Scotland, but also in, in Britain, um, those, those distilleries not only do whiskey, because if you start producing whiskey, um, you have at least three years to wait in Europe before you are legally allowed to call it whiskey. So while the whiskey rests or the spirit rests in the casks to become whiskey, they um, they do gin for a turnover just to, to, to have some money coming in, not just spending money and waiting for the whiskey. So therefore, in Scotland, each distillery does its own gin just to keep going until they wait to for, for the whiskey. And therefore, uh, gin exploded in Scotland. Each small each small distillery has its own pot still just uh, dedicated to, to gin. And, and maybe that's how the uh, craft gin uh, revolution also started, you know. Absolutely. I mean, if you look, you, you, if you look at the German language areas where I'm in here, you, you brought in Monkey 47. I think Monkey 47 was, was how to say, helped all the gins here into in, into birth because uh, it was a guy, it was two guys one was a fruit distiller and the other guy was nokia a nokia marketing manager in the yes. us alex yes. before he came back to germany because he's german and his father was a, a spirits producer and he came from america and he got all those uh, um, dry martini culture with him and said when he returned i'm going to make a gin and like Germans or German-speaking people are, the reaction was, what the hell are you going to make gin? So, <laughs> um, and, and he did, and he did a great product. But what are the latest experiments that's happening in the gin industry now, in gin distilleries that you can talk about or you've seen in recent times? Well, I mean, we just recently, eight weeks ago, we had the, the Swiss Gin Awards. And uh, okay. we had some international friends in, and when we looked at, uh, when we looked at, uh, at the scores, I must really say, we had about first eight or 10 places were Swiss pro producers. And it's not just Swiss that enter. I mean, we have equal Swiss and, uh, and international products. Uh, and then was one international and then again about eight Swiss producers. So I think the quality standards we have here at the moment in, in, in Europe are very high. People learned or know how to distill. They get their recipes right. I mean, the trend is always going away from hardcore gin because not everybody likes juniper. It goes more towards softer, fruitier. It's not even somewhere in, 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 the, in the legislation. 
which means they have a proper gin as a base and then they add in like uh, berries like uh, strawberry or uh, raspberry or like um, also orange severe orange was a big thing last year now i see i think we are. did uh, we did taste a lot of uh, we by judging we judged a lot of keyword gins as well i remember that i think so uh, it's a big trend so there's a very interesting question from gagan he says hey author the question is more about tonics than gins what do you think about flavored tonics and if one needs to sacrifice on the quinine to accentuate the flavorings to shine Mm. That's, I think, a very important question. It's a very important and a very good question. I, I really must admit. Um, okay. I mean, we we did last year. We always do a publication of these with Gin Award results. And last okay. year, we got asked by the publisher, "Why don't you do something about gin and tonic?" And um, blue-eyed, I said, "Oh yes, sure. Why not?" So we had the top ten gins. and uh, i strolled through uh, the shop of my friend and uh, and took some tonics and at the end we had nine tonics and 10 gins so it was a quite intense uh, saturday morning having 90 gin tonics wow i think quinine is very important the less there is in the more your tonic will become lemony okay. also i think it's quite important that it's real quinine and not just aroma Yeah, I mean, blah, blah, blah. I mean, fever tree and Fentimans and Schweppes and uh, the whole world chasing about Schweppes as being a bad thing. But I mean, it's the most sold tonic, and uh, whenever it is, even in India, absolutely. And whenever a, a, a producer tells me um, I have a problem with Schweppes, I tell him, well, you have a problem if your gin doesn't work with Schweppes. because each and every consumer has a bottle of Schweppes at home somewhere then uh, there are some medium flavored stuff I, i had a beautiful south african tonic um with with the fruit in so you find lots of stuff i, I took some tonic because because we said we talk about it i mean this is the yeah. classical mediterranean stuff you find um there's a little bit of add on rosemary or a little bit of add on uh, lemongrass or, or coriander or whatever and i think if you have the right gin it supports it can support the gin quite well and then there is a category of tonics um i personally don't like because they are too intense uh they have a very strong single flavor well i'm i'm not going it might be a good thing i'm not sure if you ever heard about uh, at the moment i i like this tonic quite a lot it's uh, it's a really a, a dry one uh it's new from you uh, it's uh, it's from france no it's from spain okay. but it looks french and it's it's a bone dry tonic which supports each gin equal okay. so i think that's the point if you want to discover new things and i think that's that's the difference between whiskey and gin i i want to tell you more about that but uh, if you have three tonics and three gins and three garnishes you're good to go because you have uh, three by three by three so you have 27 different versions of your gin tonic whereas with whiskey you always need a new bot- bottle so that's that's why people like gin and you um you can take half white and half brown sugar and then um you put it on on the oven and you heat it up until the sugar is dissolved and then you add in three stalks of uh, lemongrass and uh, the skin and the juice of three lemons okay and uh, then you need obviously some quinine so quinoa bark um okay 30 grams should do it so 30 grams quinoa bark on that liter and then you let it lightly lightly simmer cook for about 25 30 minutes and at the end you add about 50 grams citric acid as a as a how do you say uh, powder powdered citric yeah. acid uh, yeah. and then you simply um, take off the solids and uh, you cool down the liquid and you have a syrup 
and you need one to two centiliters of that syrup on a fair measure of gin and only need to add um, soda water. Oh. <coughs> I think I'm going to try that. You can go to your uh, uh, drugstore, drugstores, sell it. Uh, I'll try and do that. It's a nice experiment. So, I, I, I send uh, you the recipe. Yes, please do that. I think that would be great. Um, so, which are the most uh, popular gin brands for you right now in Europe, you think? Five, top five or top three? In Europe? Yeah. Well, I think the most sold gin brand still overall. Um, well, <laughs> there's a Spanish brand called Ginebra San Miguel, which is big in the Philippines. Uh, it's the, the most sold brand worldwide. It's the number one brand. And I think here yeah, outside Spain and, uh, and, and the Philippines, you have no good chance to get hold of a bottle. It's a Pernod Ricard um, and, and Beef Eater, which is a classic. Okay. So, my friend, she is also online and she is asking a question that uh, in the current times, of lockdown in India, which easily available uh, home ingredients would you recommend to pair with our favorite gin in case we don't get tonic water? Okay. <laughs> if you don't have tonic water, then what would you do? I mean, how, how would you make a good we, drink? We got, we, got, we got introduced once <laughs> in, uh, in Britain to... Uh, to, the, to a British favor, if you don't have tonic, they simply use Sprite. Sprite? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sprite was... Um, That's a very... But home ingredients, anything else that can be used to make a drink? Well, I'm, there's, I mean, what, what you always can do is uh, you take some, some gin, uh, a fair measure of gin and uh, some ice, and uh, simply add in some lime and uh, and possibly other other ingredients you you have at home like some garnishes and, and that's it if if you're good to go and you have some angostura bitter you can make a proper pink gin because pink gin is the yes. original uh, original gin cocktail what also you can do is and i know uh, citrus fruits are quite uh, quite widely available in, in India. Yeah. What you what you can do is you can can make your own gimlet, which is quite yeah. easy. You take four centiliters of gin and the, the spoon of, uh, um, where well, you can add sugar. The problem is, uh, commonly you should use a simple syrup. So you take one part water, one part uh, sugar, and dissolve it to to mix. So you take some gin. And then you add two centiliters lime or lemon juice and a little bit of uh, sugar syrup and uh, stir it on ice and you have a perfect gimlet. I think gin is moving forward. How is it? Like, which are the uh, latest uh, big markets for gin? Like you mentioned, South Africa is making a uh, huge quantity of gin and there are so many popular brands that you mentioned, uh, some of them being sent to you. So which are the countries and what is the latest trend? that you see for gin? The, I mean, the future of okay. gin. What is the future of gin? I think that's, uh, that's a very direct and, it, again, a two-folded question. I mean, um, what I can see in the market, what we can see in tastings, is uh, gin and gin, classic gin and modern gin. And the, the problem at the moment I see as a, as a death nail or coffee nail for gin is that gin is very popular and uh, each one thinks it doesn't matter what's inside the bottle as long as I state it's gin it sells and uh, I think the main, I had a tasting uh, weeks ago before the lockdown uh, and someone said you need to take this gin into the tasting this is great it's an Indian gin it has Granny Smith apple inside I thought oh, what the fuck <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I'm old enough. I see beautiful variations of gin, even uh, around the whole uh, legislation, because uh, in Europe, you need to use pure ethanol as a base. 
but lots and lots of countries start producing um, gin on a, on a base spirit they simply produce themselves. I mean, you know our friend Christian uh, from yeah. uh, from the Calvados region. He does a gin based on a on a white on a white Calvados spirit, and it's called the gin. And lots and lots of producers do it that way, and it adds a complete new world. I mean, still hard uh, hardcore gin drinkers might argue it's not gin because legally it isn't. But people like that stuff. It has the character of the distiller. It brings in more different flavors. Again, goes away from the core idea of gin. But the style, little bit because people are experimenting with all kinds of gin. So that could possibly be the future as well. Absolutely. Well, it it that <laughs> that happens already here. I mean, they uh, they. They do distilled gins, they make a beautiful gin base and then they simply add in some fruit distillates uh, like uh, wild grown fruits like uh, rowan berry distillates or, uh, or even apple or pear distillates. Um, some base it on that and some make a gin, a proper gin and simply add it in afterwards. So that's always in, in which direction you want to go. Cool. Thank you so much, Arthur for spending time on a Saturday afternoon. It's and uh, thank it, it was wonderful to